Okay, we made it. <laughs> so welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Welcome to Wednesday Night Well of Being. Welcome to this moment, being here together. My name is Tig. Uh, I'm a meditation teacher and a contemplative artist. Um, I'm trained to teach uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction and cultivating emotional balance, which are secular evidence-based meditation programs. I teach in hospitals and in universities. Um, and uh, I am teaching for a research study at Brown University called Mindfulness-Based Queer Resilience, where we're using um, these teachings to help uh, young gay men navigate the world. So um, I also wanted to start just by acknowledging the privilege that we all have to be here practicing, but um, for myself as a teacher and holding the space, the privilege that I have to have received these teachings, to have gone through teacher training, to have time to practice, and acknowledging that my point of view is influenced by um, being uh, white um, expressing it as a male gender, and that while I strive to present and provide universal tools for everyone, there may be inherent bias in things that I say or I teach. So I'd like to welcome uh, anyone that um, feels differently from anything that I may say to speak up, that we can all grow and learn together. Uh, it's important just to acknowledge that we all do carry bias. We're practicing the Dharma which is kind of this unbiased universal view, but um, it's important to acknowledge that we all carry different points of view, we come from different backgrounds. So I try my best to keep mine as universal as possible. Um, and with that, also want to begin by acknowledging the land that we're on, the native Alani land, uh, tribes. Um, San Francisco Peninsula is particularly the Kaamatush tribe. Um, so just acknowledging the uh, indigenous people that kind of come and work and live on this land uh, that we're practicing on. For so those at home, um, just taking a moment to acknowledge wherever you are, the indigenous people on that land, and uh, a moment of honor and respect for them. So as you heard um, from the announcements, SFPC is a Sangha-run organization, so I love this idea that it's we all of us. There isn't a hierarchy here. Uh, I think that's a real embodiment of the Dharma that I uh, that really resonates with me. Thank you to the volunteers for holding space online and in the space tonight, um, for all those that have been helping bring the space to life. Um, I like to think as Dharma centers as like a heart uh, and that it's like a pump and that we come here depleted and needing a refresh, just like spent blood comes into the heart, needing the fresh oxygen. Um, and then when we leave here, it's like the heart pumping us out into the world. So like we come for refuge, we come for relief and replenishment, and then the, the heart pumps us out into the world to kind of bring that ripple effect of the Dharma to all those around us. And so this center, this physical space, the digital space on Zoom, are embodiments of this Dharma heart. Um, and so your dana, your contributions help um, keep this heart pumping. Um, and I love in Buddhism that the concept behind dana is that it is not an exchange for teaching. Uh, it's to help uh, our teachers and our center thrive. The teachings are freely offered. Um, what the dana is more of an offering of generosity to keep the lights on, uh, and keep Zoom running, so we appreciate um, your generosity with that. A couple of agreements for tonight. So we're all practicing presence, so let's be here. You know, it's, it's going to be um, natural for distractions to come up, technology, whether here in the room or at home. So just making a commitment to be present as possible. Um, that this is also a safe container. So when we share that um, we're letting other people speak, we're not um, talking over them, um, we're not giving advice, uh, so avoid that as much as possible. And that whatever said here stays here. Even though this is being recorded, 
the idea that what someone shares here is left in this container. So we don't talk about it afterwards or go find someone outside. And even if it's a positive thing, you know, like, oh, I really resonate with what you shared. Sometimes that might make people feel uncomfortable sharing in the future. So just really um, supporting each other through creating a safe um, and inclusive container. Um, as always, those of you who have sat with me have heard me say, you know, invitation to bring an open mind. Uh, so if you're newer to the practices, just bringing that sense of curiosity and interest. And if you are a longtime practitioner, bringing a beginner mind. Every moment is different. Each point in our mind stream is constantly changing. So you may have heard teachings like what I'm about to offer tonight in the past, but see if it's possible to bring it, bring uh, this beginner's mind if it's the first time you've heard it. Um, and then lastly, take care of yourself. So you have agency here. So if you need to take a break, take a break. If something in the practice is coming up really strong and you need to kind of let go of my guidance and go to your breath or the feeling of the body on the ground, please take care of yourself. Uh, you know what you need most. Um, so as I like to say, this is not meditation boot camp. So we can be relaxed, we can be at ease, and we can listen to what we need. Okay. So <clears throat> Um, for well of being, the class that Chandra and Eve usually hold space for, um, Chandra finished the book um, that we've been following for the past couple months. Uh, last week wrapped that up. Um, Chandra is off spending time with family and Eve is resting, getting ready to teach a retreat this weekend. Um, so it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, I was given kind of free reign because we're in between this, the bardo of <laughs> in between books. <laughs> Yeah. Everything is always in transition. Um, so tonight I'm going to offer what I call thought surfing. Uh, so it's working with mental formations and how we can help alleviate suffering through the observation of the mind. So I'm going to be offering some practices and some teachings to help cultivate that sense of awareness and um, to really explore how these practices can help us um, find a skillful response, a skillful relationship to all the chatter that's happening in there. <clears throat> um, so with thought, thought surfing, um, you, many of you may be familiar with the foundations of mindfulness, the four foundations that the Buddha taught that are alive and well in our society as we begin to witness the flourishing of the Dharma in the West. And so these foundations, the first foundation is um, sensations we explore through body, body sensations and breath. The second foundation of mindfulness being feeling tones. So once we feel a sensation, we notice, is it pleasant, is it unpleasant, or is it neutral? And then the third foundation is thoughts and emotions, which we're going to be focusing on tonight. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that in a second. But we know that it's these foundations of mindfulness that really help us follow what's happening in our life from the moment that we receive sensory input, whether it's something that someone says, some, says to us, something that we hear, something that we think, um, and how we then assign a judgment of uh, that feels good, that feels bad, that then leads to the mental formation around attachment and aversion, which is and those that have our practitioners in the room know this is where the cycle of suffering begins. Um, so we're going to be learning to relate to our thoughts in a way that alleviates suffering tonight, um, practice relating to those thoughts in a constructive way, and moving from reacting to our thoughts to skillfully responding to them. And what I love about this is so much of the Dharma is taught about what's happening outside of us. How do we have a skillful response to all these difficult things that are happening in the world? And tonight we're really going to be looking at the internal world. Yes, it may be stimulated by things that we hear out in the world or experience in the world, but tonight we're really going to be looking at the internal environment and how we can respond skillfully to sometimes intrusive thoughts, sometimes uncomfortable or unpleasant thoughts. Uh, in a way that alleviates suffering for us and those around us. Um, so that's just kind of a framework of tonight. We're going to move into our first practice. Um, and so we're going to explore our thoughts. 
Um, but before that, we're going to kind of lead in with exploring some of those sensations in the body and also a very brief touch into listening practice before we then transition into thoughts. So kind of a multifaceted practice. It'll be about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, so finding the posture that feels comfortable. There's um, blankets and cushions around if anyone here would like to sit. Um, at home, you're welcome to sit, stand, lay down, whatever feels comfortable. <clears throat> and so as we transition from the outer world to the inner world, maybe we like to close your eyes or lower them down to a surface, a soft gaze. As we begin to settle in, let's just take a moment to reflect on what brought us here tonight. What's our motivation in coming together as a Sangha to practice? Whatever that motivation is, just taking a moment to form that into a heartfelt intention. So perhaps it's to be present, to be curious, to be open, to be relaxed, to find refuge, and making this, in uh, this intention in service to ourselves and as an act of generosity to all those beings around us. Bring our attention to an awareness of the breath. And on your next in-breath, breathing in a sense of a vivid attention, feeling the air as it moves through the nostrils and into the body. And as we exhale, a sense of softening, relaxing the muscles of the face. Inhaling again, a sense of uprightness in the posture. And then exhaling, a sense of ease through the shoulders, the arms, the torso. Inhaling, a sense of stability as we breathe in. And then exhaling, letting go of any squeezing or tightness in the abdomen, the pelvic floor. Continue an awareness of the breath, just feeling that stability, that balance, that centeredness. Perhaps you'd like to broaden the awareness for a few moments to sensations in the body. Whether you're staying with the breath or perhaps moving to another part of the body or uh, sensing into the energy that's in the body. Noticing where the mind went with that invitation. Go to a specific part of the body. There's no right or wrong here, just allowing the awareness to drop out of the thinking mind and down into the felt experience of the body. Perhaps noticing a busy mind, the awareness already slipping away into thoughts or other sensory experiences, maybe a lingering energy from the day or a to-do list. And all of that is welcome here. Just noticing that that's where the mind goes. And then gently inviting it to return back to this moment, sensations in the body.
We're not trying to stop anything from happening. We're just being curious and noticing what the experience is like as we rest with the somatic field. As we were briefly talking into talking about before, the feeling tone, so noticing or pleasant or unpleasant sensations, how the mind may be reacting. And for just a few moments, let's shift our awareness from sensations in the body. Now, coming up to the eardrum and shifting the awareness to listening, becoming aware of sound or perhaps lack of sound. The invitation here is to rest the awareness in the eardrum. Don't go out looking for sound, just allow it to come to you. Noticing sounds that are more steady and consistent. Sounds that may layer on top that arise and then disappear. Exploring what it's like to be the receiver of the sound. Waves of vibration moving through the air into our eardrum and being processed in the brain. Perhaps noticing your relationship to the sound, maybe a sense of space between you and the origin of the sound. Once again, noticing if there's any labeling of pleasant or unpleasant, any mental formation, thoughts, or emotions that arise from certain sounds. Remembering that every time the mind wanders away from the sounds, and we notice that, we gently return. It's the return that's building these pathways to presence. So one aspect of this practice is the single point of concentration on the sound, listening. The other part of the practice is returning when the mind inevitably wanders away. Remembering that we need a wandering mind in order to practice returning back to this moment. Now let's make another shift into our thoughts. 
bringing the awareness from sound into the mental formations. I'm going to offer a couple options here for those of us that like to visualize, perhaps imagining that you're laying on the ground looking up at the blue sky and every thought like a cloud slowly drifting by. Or perhaps imagining yourself in an empty movie theater and your thoughts as words scrolling across an empty screen. For me, I like to visualize my awareness like a bubble expanding, giving space for all the chatter in my mind to just be there. And these thoughts may show up as words, they may show up as images, they may show up as songs. Resting here in the domain of the mind, curious, alert, relaxed. Just like surfing on the ocean, we need to keep a sense of looseness, staying soft, staying centered and grounded, leaning back in the mind and watching the thoughts as they unfold. Just like we were practicing with the sound, not going out looking for thoughts, just resting here and allowing the thoughts you. And just like sound, noticing thoughts that may be consistent and repeating, thoughts that may layer on top, arrive and then disappear more quickly, thoughts that may lead to other thoughts. And here we are, just relaxed, alert, watching all of this unfold in the domain of the mind. If at any point this becomes overwhelming or confusing, you can always return to the breath or the feeling of the ground beneath the body to stabilize yourself and then return to the domain of the mind whenever you feel ready. Some of us, the thoughts may be coming slowly with lots of space in between. For others, there may be a symphony of chatter in the mind. There's no right or wrong. I'm not trying to stop thoughts or push anything away. So continue to practice in this way for the next few minutes in silence.
taking a moment here to check in and see where the attention is now, gathering up all of your awareness and returning back to the domain of the mind. In the final few minutes of practice, let's check in with how we're relating to the thoughts. So is our feeling tone associated with the thought, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral? Our thoughts stirring up emotions or feelings in the body. You're paying particular attention to how we're identifying with the thought. So just like when we hear sound, we don't identify as that sound, we're the listener. And so too with thoughts, we are not the thought, we're the receiver of them. So again, leaning back in the mind, relaxing, being loose and soft, allowing the thoughts to come to you. And now releasing the awareness from the domain of the mind. But before we come to an end of this practice, let's take a moment just to ground and center ourselves. Oftentimes when we spend this much time in the mind, we can feel a little flighty or untethered. So perhaps you'd like to take a few deep breaths and return to the sensation of the body. Maybe you'd like to sense into the feeling of the chair or the floor beneath the body. I could check in on any shifts that have happened in the past 25 minutes. The quality of the awareness, the mood, the emotion. And together, let's all follow one breath in. Feeling the air as it expands to the body. And then as we exhale, letting go of the air, letting go of this practice, taking the time to transition back to open eyes and you have them closed and making any movements or stretches that would feel supportive to help make this transition back to an awareness of the world around us. all for being in this process with me. <clears throat> so we have some time to welcome. We had some time to check in and ask questions, share what that experience may have been like for you or ask any questions that have come up. <clears throat> Um, if you're on Zoom, you can um, type your questions into the chat and Cage will read them out loud. So what did you all notice? The 
Mm -hmm. Mace, Mace is describing her experience as a battle. And I think part of it is that I, you know, the, the good, the, the rule follower part, the long to do meditation, right? It's so easy to like get out of the box. You know, it's like running around the fire. So Mace is um, describing that it, she feels like she's running around with a fire extinguisher, uh, following the rules, duking it out with the thoughts. And then I like what you said, what Um, so Mace is describing uh, some moments of spaciousness in the practice and also how some thoughts lead to other thoughts. Mace, I'm curious if you could describe a bit of uh, the, um, so you described two different kind of polarities there, duping it out and then moments of spaciousness. So you can talk a little bit more about that. I think my natural, like my, you know, my neural roots of meditating is to keep it out. But I thought that I was back to what is going on on many different things. I was very agitated. So I'm just used to like, you know, trying to bring all the thoughts out. Mm. Um, versus sort of the practice that I teach you are trying to do. You have to do it. It was the thought. Spacious. So Mace is describing uh, a, a sense of a container being spacious for some moments of the practice and then being smaller and tighter in other moments of the practice. Thank you for sharing that. And I think this is a really good point. You know, we heard Mace use the words like duke it out, almost like there was a fight. And a lot of the analogies tonight that we're going to use, because the theme of the class is thought surfing. So imagine if a surfer, whether us or we're watching someone, is on the surfboard trying to fight the wave, right? Like trying to punch the wave or trying to stop the wave. It's not, we, we won't be able to ride the wave if we're resisting it. Um, and so I think that that's a really um, keen observation there. And, and to say in this practice, there's no right or wrong. There will be moments that it's going to be tight and there's going to be other moments where it's spacious. Um, so I do appreciate that. And I think it really, and you keep coming back to that analogy of what is it like to be on a surfboard? You know, loose, knees bent, kind of finding our center. Uh, the body moves. The body doesn't stay static and rigid when it's on a surfboard. It needs to stay loose so it can move with the momentum of the wave. It can ride it. These are all really good analogies of how we can kind of hang ten in our mind. You heard Eve say a lot, lean back in the mind. I was saying a lot during that. It's just kind of like leaning back and watching the moments of tightness and the moments of openness and seeing what that's like with curiosity. Thank you, Nate. Anyone else have any observations or questions? <clears throat> I was thinking kind of like over and I'm like, you know, like the movie scene, but I don't know if you can see it in the bubble. Yeah. I went, I don't know if I like when I can see it in the bubble. Yeah. 
and tell me your name. Oh, I'm Vicky. Sorry. Vicky. So yeah. Vicky was just describing the um, a resonance with the invitation to think of the domain of the mind as like a bubble, and that what was actually happening in the practice was uh, smaller bubbles could kind of open up within within that larger bubble. And those of you that have sat with me before, I always use this analogy when I'm teaching about salt, salt water. So like if we take a cup of salt and we put it in a cup of water uh, and try and drink it, it's gonna be really disgusting. It's gonna be hard to drink it. But if we take the same cup of water in you know, a gallon bucket, it will probably not taste great, but we could drink it. And then the same cup of salt in a five gallon bucket that we probably wouldn't even really notice it. And so I usually use that analogy when I'm teaching about the heart opening practices, loving kindness and compassion, how they help kind of open up the space. But it really works here. And thank you for, for bringing that out too, because we're not, I, I'm going to keep saying it all night. We're not trying to stop thoughts. We can't, you know, it's just like trying to stop sounds. Um, and so I think that this analogy really works here because we can open up more space around them, allow them to be there rather than fighting. So thank you for, for bringing that around. I always love the opportunity to talk about salt. <laughs> <laughs> Someone actually said the other day, you know, we do need a little bit of salt for things to taste good. And I also thought that that was a really wise uh, kind of um, reflection on, like, you know, again, we're not trying to get rid of the salt. We actually need some of it. Um, we just don't need it, you know, uh, with another cup of water. More water with it. So, uh, hi, Kate. Oh, hi, hi, Tig. I just wanted to, I just have a comment real quick that I really appreciated the, um, the receiving the sound. Because I, right as you were saying, don't go searching for it, I, I was. I was really searching all the sounds in the house and it really allowed me to relax and it was much um, sort of softer and easier to just let the sound come to me. And then it was really helpful then to segue into the, the thoughts because then it was, I could let the thoughts just come and I felt sort of less uh, responsible for them or like, I don't know, like they were just happening and I could just receive them and let them go and not be so attached or have a bunch of emotions wrapped inside of them or I'm bad or I'm good or this is pleasant or unpleasant or um, so that was really helpful. Yeah, really insightful. Thanks for sharing that, Kate. And I love pairing the listening meditation with the thought meditation because if we think, you know, in, in, in Buddhism, um, many Eastern lineages, thoughts are a sense. You know, so we have the five senses that we're familiar with, but then we also have thinking as actually a sense. And what I love about this and what Cage is pointing to is that just like sound, we receive sound, we receive taste, we receive thoughts. And a lot of times part of the illusion or delusion <laughs> is that we are the thoughts um, that we're so you know, we're talking a lot of analogies tonight about spaciousness and tightness. And a lot of times in our mind, in our samsaric mind, we're so tight to the thought that we can't even put space between it and that we think that it's ours. And so a lot of times I think, you know, I said it a little bit in the meditation, but like when we hear a car horn out there, we never think that that's us. You know, we don't identify as the car horn. So with this philosophy of not thinking as a sense, then same thing, the thought, it's, it would be like identifying as the sound or the taste, like, ooh, I am that, that salty or that sweet. Um, it really gives a lot of permission to shift the way that we relate to the thought as, an, as the receiver of it, which then kind of opens the door for how we work with it. So I'm glad that you were, you were um, experiencing that cage. Um, and I think something else to kind of go deeper on with that is that just like in the Dharma, the teachings are that the sensory experiences in and of themselves are not inherently good or bad. It's how we are relating and assigning the positive and negative attributes to them. In the emotional balance course, we, talk, we don't talk about good and bad emotions. We talk about constructive and destructive. And so it's the same thing as thought. They aren't inherently good or bad. Now, 
that's to say that you know if we follow them through to fruition they could be very destructive i'm not saying that like free reign to just act on any thought but it does really allow us some time to reflect on the nature of the thought uh, i i don't know about you all i have some weird thoughts sometimes you know they're like intrusive and i had to do like there's a lot of conditioning that i've had from this culture that that shapes the way that thoughts form and so at some point in my practice, I just started bringing a sense of humor to them. You know, like I walk down the street and the thought comes down about like, why did, that, why did they do, why, why is it the way that it is? You know, and it's like, oh, I can just kind of relax a little bit. Like, that's not my thought. My accountability is what I do with that thought. You know, so if I have a thought that is not very friendly or kind or aligned with my ethics or values, I'm not going to spend time feeling bad about it. I'm just not going to follow, I'm going to acknowledge it and then I'm not going to follow it through. But this comes with space. You know, a lot of times if we're so tight and we're identifying as the thinker of the thought, there's self deprecation. I'm such a bad person that I'm having these awful thoughts. And what I love about the Dharma is it, yes, there's the thoughts, but then there's the action that we take behind it. And so it's practices like observing our thoughts that help open up that space that we can work with it. Uh, if there are any questions and you're online, please feel free to type them in the chat at any time. And when we have breaks, we can uh, look at that. Uh, go ahead, Kate. Bring it in. Um, I want to read this uh, passage that comes from, it's actually one of my teachers um, in the mindfulness organization that I teach uh, that helps kind of put this in perspective. In becoming more aware of our thoughts and our personal patterns of thinking, we catch increasing glimpses of the fluid and permanent and transitory nature of everything and the potential freedom and flexibility that comes with this kind of awareness. As you simply sit with and acknowledge whatever arrives in the mind without evaluation, judgment, or striving for certain outcomes, you develop greater stability of mind, greater capacity to let things be, and greater insight and compassion in daily life. As you become more aware of the stories you spin and the mental traps you set for yourself, you begin to disengage from them with greater ease. Now, mm -hmm. As you become more aware of the stories you spin and the mental traps you set for yourself, you begin to disengage from them with greater ease. So I think it's that disengagement that we're really looking at here as we explore the relationship that we have to our other senses. We're not engaged with them in the same way that we are with thoughts. And so it's kind of this potential freedom and flexibility that we're practicing with allows some of that um, disengagement to happen. <clears throat> uh, a few weeks ago when I was teaching here, we talked about the emotional episode timeline. Uh, and so how an emotion unfolds. Um, we have the trigger that is made up of uh, the, um, an event, something that happens, a precondition, how we're feeling before that event, like we're tired or we haven't eaten, um, and then our personal database. So what's happened in the past that is making us a trigger. Uh, and so once the trigger happens, we then move into a process called selective filtering. We're not seeing clearly anymore once we move into that trigger. Um, and it is both from the physiological standpoint and the psychological standpoint. So um, with that teaching, I had offered a diaphragmatic breath to help calm the body when we are in a trigger. But this practice, working with our thoughts, really helps with the psychological state that unfolds once an emotion, once we are triggered, um, by being able to say, okay, I'm, I'm noticing these thoughts coming. I might not be seeing clearly right now because I'm super triggered fill in the blank emotion, I'm angry, I'm sad. And when the more that we practice observing our thoughts, the more space that we're opening, this, this container that we're giving our thoughts, we're not um, as ruled by them. And so on the emotional episode timeline, what happens after the state of mind, the state of the body, is that we go into destructive or constructive action. So the way that we teach this is that if we can use these practices along the episode of an emotion, it kind of cuts the cord of either the severity or the polarization of the emotion or the destructive result from it. So just another uh, way of looking at how this practice supports um, our well-being from an emotional standpoint.
knowing that we're in a selective filtering period after we're triggered and knowing that it is possible to work with this thought, not be identified with it and find a skillful response to it. I want to um, really clearly say that we are not trying to bypass thoughts. So if there's an uncomfortable thought, we do need to look at it. You know, we can't just, I, I think that in a lot of spiritual circles right now, there's this, uh, like, just find a happy thought, choose another thought. That does come at some point in the process of this, but not in the beginning. We have to be with what's happening before we try and choose another way. So I think sometimes, you know, I hear teaching meditation, especially to people who have never practiced before, I hear all the time, like, oh, I can't turn my thoughts off. You know, <laughs> good luck trying. You know, if you ever hear a teacher, <laughs> if you ever hear a teacher saying, you know, just empty your mind of thoughts. I don't know if they're really the best teacher for you to go to because they're probably not practicing, right? Because if you, if you're really practicing with your thoughts, you know that you can't stop them and and the destruction that comes from trying to. Because um, then we start internalizing that, and the body starts showing up as disease. So I think. <laughs> Run <laughs> up a waterfall. And it's just like, oh, no, I can't do that. Right, exactly. <laughs> and then I love, like, get the magic wand out and let me stop thinking. Like, that's not how this works. So there's a bit of a gray area. And I just wanted to pause and say that we're not trying to bypass difficult or intrusive thoughts. This is where therapy can be really helpful. Um, this is where talking with a teacher can be really helpful. Um, but in terms of this practice, we're actually doing the opposite. Instead of pushing anything away, we're saying, ah, an interesting thought. You know, I didn't realize that I had my, I have more of a sense of humor in my observing mind than I do in my, like, mind interacting with people. Because there's space there, you know, and you're like, well, that's a ridiculous thought, you know, and kind of, and kind of giggle about it. It brings that lightheartedness, which I think this idea of thought surfing being relaxed, being loose, kind of, you know, that surfer mentality of like hang tang, kawabanga, you know, like there's something that feels kind of lighthearted about it, even when they are difficult thoughts. And the last thing I'll say before we kind of open up if there's any, any questions on this. Um, just lost my thought. <laughs> 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 right. That this doesn't need to be complicated. The practice for this is just watching the thoughts. That's it. You know, I'm giving a teaching here and we talked about some of the science of emotions and stuff. And that's all good to know. It can be helpful for a lot of people to have a cognitive understanding of this, but also to really just trust the innate wisdom of the mind, trust the practice. All we have to do to create that space is just practice watching the thoughts. In the meditation, I offered uh, a point of view, especially with sound. There's space between us and the sound. There's space that this vibrating wave moves through and comes into our ear, so we don't feel like we are the sound. And a lot of times in the mind, that space is hard to feel. So when we are practicing, that's why we offer the suggestion of like the thoughts of the cloud or a movie screen, or a leaf on the stream, or visualizing this bubble. So what we're trying to do is create space between us and the thought, so we can be the observer rather than the reactor to it. Um, and then I'm going to offer this other passage, and then see if there's any questions before we move into our next practice. Um, for any of those, uh, any of us that have read the book Old Path White Clouds, it's kind of the story of the Buddha from the time that he was born all the way through his journey and enlightenment and all the way to the death of his body. And there was this, this one passage and it's just so powerful to me that he, the Buddha, is reportedly said that in the moment of his enlightenment, he said, jail keeper, oh jail where I see you clearly now and I'm free from your shackles. And when I heard that, I was like, he's talking about mental formations. He's talking about the ego, you know, like that you can be there. These thoughts can be there, but we can be free. We don't have to be ruled by them. And so I love this. Um, so Thich Nhat Hanh actually wrote, uh, translated that book. Um, so it's like told in his very beautiful, poetic kind of voice. And so I want to read this paragraph. Um, 
that was written by Thich Nhat Hanh about the Buddha's experience. Um, the Buddha felt as though a prison which had confined him for thousands of lifetimes had broken open. Ignorance had been the jailkeeper. Because of ignorance, his mind had been obscured, just like the moon and stars hidden by the storm clouds. Clouded by endless waves of deluded thoughts, the mind had falsely divided reality into subject and object, self and others, existence, non-existence, birth and death. <laughs> I'm going to start that sentence over. For those of you on Zoom, we had uh, a little musical entertainment go by. <laughs> Clouded by endless waves of deluded thoughts, the mind had falsely divided reality into subject and object, self and others, existence and non-existence, birth and death, and from these discriminations arose wrong views, the prisons of feelings, craving, grasping, and becoming. The suffering of birth, old age, sickness, and death only made the prison walls thicker. The only thing to do was to seize the jailkeeper and see his true face. The jailkeeper was ignorance. Once the jailkeeper was gone, the jail would disappear and never be rebuilt again. So, you know, I think what he's pointing to here is that it's this ignorance that arises from the lack of clear seeing of our mental formations and our thoughts. And I, you know, when he says about the prison walls become thicker, um, the, the feelings, craving, grasping, becoming, these are all the outputs. What, when we talk about the four foundations of mindfulness, we have a sensation, there's a feeling tone behind it, and then we push and pull against it. We push. We push if it doesn't feel good, we pull it in if it does feel good. These are all uh, these are all leading to that ignorance. It's what's building the jail cell that we live in. And so we've been talking a lot about creating space, opening up room. So in my perspective, I think that is part of the path to enlightenment. It's creating space for these things to move through us. So anything coming up for you all that you want to bring up or ask questions before we move into our next practice? Ting, I have one question. What was the book you were reading from? It's called Old Path, White Clouds. Old Path, White Clouds? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank I highly you. recommend it. And if you get it, and once you stop reading it, it, you're never going to be able to put it down. It's one of those. And it's like this thick. Lots of insight. Most of the book is written in quotations and quoted right from sutras. Um, so it's a, it's a really powerful, and just, you get the transmission of the lifetime of the Buddha and also Thich Nhat Hanh's interpretation of it. So should we do another practice? Uh, one of the things that I've noticed in teaching this is that people, the tightness that we've been talking about, it is really hard to observe thoughts when they're in here. So in this practice, we're actually going to journal. So um, grab some paper and pen. There's some here for those in the room. So in that practice, there is this offering to watch your thoughts on the movie screen or watch them like clouds. In this practice, we're going to use stream of consciousness writing as a meditation. So we're going to be observing our thoughts as we think them and write them down. So for any of us that aren't familiar with stream of consciousness, we just write whatever comes to mind. So grammar, um, sentence structure, punctuation, completely out the window. Uh, you can just write, you know, just keep writing. Even if there's no thoughts, just write no thoughts. Or I don't know what to write. Or I hate doing this exercise. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> it could be, you know, as you're writing things like a memory of a dream that you had last night might come up. You might start writing a to-do list or a grocery list. Just whatever pops into your mind, you just write down. Okay, so for the next eight minutes, we're just going to keep writing stream of consciousness. So in this way, instead of observing them in our mind, we're going to be watching them kind of come out onto the paper. Okay, so before we start, let's just 
take a moment to let the teaching go, let the practices go before this. Maybe you like to close your eyes just for a moment, find your center. Remembering that analogy, like we're on a surfboard, we're loose. We're able to flow. The body is relaxed. And as we start to transition into this period of writing practice, tapping into the thoughts and allowing them to pour down from wherever they originate from, through the arms and pen and onto the paper. Whenever you're ready, beginning to write.
Okay, so let's bring that practice to a close. So just taking a moment to reflect what that was like. Maybe even looking at the page, not reading it, but just looking at it. This is, this is the domain of the mind that we're looking at. We're looking at the thoughts that we're just moving through. So what was that like for y'all? I thought that it was so mundane, boring. Mundane and boring. Yeah. But yeah, there's this. Yeah. I mean, there, there are things that are useful to think about, but not all of them. Can you all online hear it? No. So he was sharing that he um, is assessing his thoughts as mundane and pedestrian. Um, and but the last thing that you're saying, I think is really important. And it was about the timing of, yeah. what, you know, like, and that that's exactly what we're doing here. So we're looking at the, this space that opens up by being with the thought because it's the time that I want to deal with that thought, you know, like a lot of times I will notice like a very intrusive thought coming, like, right before I'm about to sit down and start teaching or something like that. And I'm like, not, not right now, you know, like I can, a lot of times I'm not suggesting this, this is my own personal mantra. Um, but a lot of times I just say, no, you know, like the thought comes and I'm like, no, 
not now, you know, like I'll deal with that one later. So I like that you're, you know, that you're saying like there's certain a time and a place for certain thoughts. So thank you for sharing. That. I, I thought it was really interesting how I tried to control it. So I was, and then I kept on thinking, why am I thinking that I think I can control it? So, you know, it kind of like looped into that, like that spiral of like, yeah, thinking about why I'm thinking and what I'm thinking. So that I thought it was interesting how I didn't want to just like let go yeah, just trying to control it. Well, it obviously doesn't really work, but um, yeah. And what was it like when you were just kind of, were there periods where you were able to let go and just let it out? A little bit at the end. When I think when the noise came, if the car alarm, that's when I was like able to wander around. Mm. Although it was annoying, but but yeah, it was a good disruption, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it really goes back to this kind of pleasant, unpleasant, the feeling tone around thoughts. You know, I don't, I don't like this thought. I don't like this annoyance that I'm having. But if we push that, push that too far away and we don't deal with it, it can cause problems later. So um, very interesting observation. And again, going back to that, analogy of the thought surfing and, and surfing in a wave like we can't control the wave the only thing that we can control is our positioning of the body and how it's riding the wave uh so something to keep in mind there thank you for sharing i'm curious what did you notice between the writing meditation and the eyes closed or you know in, in the sitting meditation how was that different or the same i think i was like i don't know i was pretty sleepy during the meditation and it wasn't obvious that normally it is but i was more aware Especially, I mean, I guess in retrospect, but even as I was doing it, like, I'm aware of this activity. You know, this is like more meta awareness of the thing. And then, and then that was sort of interesting. It's like, I don't know, I just think this is a badass subject to be doing dumb stuff about. Know? <laughs> because, because normally it is just like, thoughts are bad, don't take them seriously, you know, whatever. You know, there's, there's not going to be a painting, but I don't know. There's not a particular. I haven't heard a lot of curiosity like this. And as I was writing them, I was like, oh yeah, I'm like, there's there's an idea that pops in that is that like I'm clear about, and then the language is like then the word comes about how to like capture that. Mm. But it's, you know, it's like sort of an object, and I usually know it, and then I use language to like say, mm -hmm. you know, have the nuances of it. But I'm doing it all the time in my own life, or my exciting life. Yeah. <laughs> so Brendan is just describing the difference of that. It felt like, I don't know if you said these words, but it felt like there was more, uh, I definitely didn't say this, but like more states when you're writing. Sure. Uh, yeah. And that this last part you were just you were describing, um, kind of there's something that comes before the thought that's not word, like pre pre word pre verbal, so a feeling or an image or inspiration that then is expressed through words. Yeah, yeah. And I like like to do that. Yeah, I mean I can feel myself liking not just you know in this activity but like in general. Mm. That's what I'm up to. I want to make this work, you know, I want to make this a center. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's really like a weird little itch that I get on scratching mm -hmm. as I narrate my little boring, I mean, exciting life. I love neutral. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so he's, Brendan is, is describing that he actually likes that, you know, that this kind of inspiration or this knowing forms and then words come behind that. And I think that that's also something really important as we practice mindfulness of thoughts. Like, as I said before, sometimes they're 
mental images, sometimes a visualization, sometimes they're words, sometimes they're songs, sometimes it's just a sound, you know, so, and who knows, I'm not trying to teach about like the origins of thoughts, like we don't really know that for sure. We know it's a chem we know it has to do with chemicals in the brain, but beyond that, that's not my place to teach on. We're just noticing, and it sounds like you're um, looking at kind of the beginning point of the thought formation, which is a really interesting way of looking at that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I just think it's really, really cool about that. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't hear it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're doing it. We I mean, at an insane rate in our regular lives. Right. Well, I, I think that's, you know, one of the big things is that, like, with, with these practices that we're slowing things down, whether it's our thoughts, whether it's the emotional episode, we're just slowing them down so then we can start looking at them and, and using the practices as antidotes along the way so where we can alleviate suffering for ourselves or others. And that's a big thing that we're doing here. You know, the, it's in that spaciousness that we're creating with our thoughts, we're able to choose the thoughts that are more um, benevolent, that are more beneficial to us and to other people. And that's really what Dharma is. It's the wisdom of clear seeing, shaking hands with compassion and an open heart. And so if we can apply that to our thoughts, we're Dharma practitioners. Any other observations? <laughs> and then, like, all throughout your, like, what is this going to be a place? Like, there was, like, a part of me that just felt like, what is this thing? And I was just like, oh, God. And I thought it was super funny, so I was like, you know, being in meditation, I was thinking, I'm upset about the thoughts, and I want to ask for what I was given permission, then I'm upset that it was still going on. <laughs> So Maze was describing that when she first heard that we were going to be writing, she was excited and she was going to do her to-do list. And then as the practice started and it started getting a bit boring or frustrating, that wasn't liking it so much. And this is, you know, you've all heard me talk about the mind gym before. Like it, it's the most, it's when we have the unpleasant experiences, that's the resistance that we need in order to grow stronger. You know, just like when we lift a heavy weight in the gym, the really uncomfortable thoughts. Or, I mean, I think I even wrote like, um, I think I wrote some things like that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, did you want to share? Well, I just think it's funny. Like, all throughout your, is this ever going to end? Are you going to do the long time? Like, you know, like, it's all like, you know, like, so Mace is reporting that. Well, she's laughing. I don't know if you can hear. She's laughing. And that's really what we're looking, you know, like bringing that lightheartedness to this, that kind of ease, uh, approaching our mental activity as something that could potentially be funny, even if they're uncomfortable or intrusive thoughts. So um, I invite us to continue exploring with that kind of attitude. Thank you. Nick. The one thing I wanted to share from my own practice, like when I write like this, first of all, it's hard because when I am with the domain in my mind, just with my eyes closed, it seems like I can hold multiple thoughts at one time, where when I'm writing, I feel like I have to like pick one of the 15 that's coming at that time. So that's one thing that I noticed. The other thing that I noticed, and we talked a little bit about it with thoughts as a sense, is that um, the light is far away from me. The sound is over there. Like it feels separate. And when I write, it feels like the thoughts are first. It gives me more space between the observing mind and the thinking mind. And so I started doing this um, about six years ago, uh, writing three pages every morning. It's for those of you that uh, there's a uh, practice called morning pages. Um, and uh, it just, you know, in that, that practice, it really helped to purge thoughts, ideas, things that are just kind of getting backed up in there because we are thinking multiple thoughts at the same time. Um, but it did really allow me a lot of space between observing TIG and um, thinking TIG. Uh, and so I, I didn't, I don't feel as wound up so closely to the thoughts anymore. Any other final thoughts or questions before we end our class today? 
Okay. So let's dedicate our time together. Maybe you'd like to close the eyes just for a few more moments. And just taking a moment to recall the past hour and a half, the practices of observing the mind, listening to the teachings on mental formations, maybe even recalling the intention that was set at the beginning of this class and the work that we've done together tonight. So let's dedicate this time and energy to the alleviation of suffering. May these practices support each of us to move forward from this moment with awareness and compassion, not just for ourselves, but all beings. May we continue cultivating a sense of benevolence in our thoughts and actions. May we be free from the obscurations that keep us confined in the prison of ignorance. May we and all beings be happy and free. And may there be peace in the world. Thank you all for joining me tonight and sharing this practice. I'll be teaching a monthly sitting on the first Tuesday uh, of every month that's going to be exploring how we bring mindfulness back into the Dharma. So in the secular world, it's kind of been pulled out. And so how mindfulness is actually used as an act of generosity and compassion and um, sits into the system of Dharma, that we don't lose the ethics and the values that mindfulness was originally taught with. So I'll be teaching that the first Tuesday um, in the evening of every month. And then also on September 18th, I'll be teaching uh, a mandala meditation workshop the Saturday afternoon. Uh, so I do uh, mandala, it's my primary form of art. Um, and so I'll be teaching a couple different methods of how to use them, both of looking at them and making them um, to help deepen our practice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Safe container. <laughs> so thank you all. Thanks for joining from home. Thank you, Cage, for holding the space online. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. It's great. Are you going to be in person on the 18th for the mandala? Is it online? Yep. It would be hybrid. It's in person and online. online. Oh, great. I teach, so I do teach this course at Pratt Institute, which is a design school in New York. So, and that's all online. So I'm very well versed at teaching this on the, on Zoom now. <laughs>